Tom will be controlling our slides. I'm Virginia, that's Tommy. You can also see there we're patent attorneys at Page White and Farrah. So if you just want to move to the next slide, Tom, before I go into this slide, I wanted to just explain a little bit about why we're sitting here in an AI and ethics talk. And for that, you have to go back in time somewhat. So it was well established when the patent systems were first built that maths in particular was not something that could be patented. Everybody knew that. And, and that was a, a, a principle behind the building of the patent systems. You couldn't be granted monopolies for maths. You couldn't be granted monopolies for things that went on in people's heads. And then that later became enshrined in certain laws that you couldn't uh, get patents for software. And everybody was you know, quite comfortable with that. Of course, things changed. Uh, the entire world economy started to depend very much on software. And so patents were granted for software. And back in the 80s, this started to create something of a stir and, and a movement began at the time with a relatively small voice, which, which grew with time, which was that software in particular shouldn't be the subject of a patent. That was inherently unethical. Patents for software were bad. And if they couldn't be banned altogether, they should at least be hemmed in. And this debate really, really got force in the late 90s and early 2000s because thousands, tens of thousands of software patents were being granted. Despite these so-called rules of the law, and we'll get to those in a moment, um, patents for software were regularly being granted in large numbers. Now, Sophia has uh, given us a beautiful outline at the beginning of her talk of the pace of technology in the last sort of 10 to 15 years, the different stages that computing has gone through in particular. And all of these have been mirrored by patents being granted for those technologies. So what we have to do is just accept that software patents are here. They are enabled by the law. And the question is, how do we use them ethically? How do we use the ability that the law has given us to protect our software and to some extent our mathematical models by way of patents? So before I go into that, I, I want to just sort of point out that for me, the whole patent debate, which I've been closely, closely uh, connected to for many years of my professional life, was sort of missing the point in a sense. So you have in front of you a pie chart which shows all of the different kinds of intellectual property rights which subsist in your AI innovation, in your software technology. So in the dark blue, you have what I've called confidential rights, confidential information, trade secrets, know-how. These are all rights which rest on the ability to keep something back end locked down. In the pink sector, you have so-called copying rights, database rights, goodwill, copyright, unregistered designs. And these are all rights which largely exist automatically. You don't have a, a government to grant them to you in any particular case. They just arise. So they have to be also dealt with ethically. And then you have the registered rights, trademarks, registered designs, and in particular patents, which was where the, de where the debate was storming. So let's just look into each of these rights into a little bit more detail and see, you know, are there ethical concerns around these? What are they there for and how should they be used? So just before I talk about copyright in particular, just think about the idea behind these rights. These rights are there to protect people's innovation to make sure that investment is made and advances technology to give everybody the possibility to do this such that it's not the exclusive right of individual large companies and you can go to the copyright piece now so copyright which is a right which in most countries just automatically exists is a good right it protects the code of your software the particular code but it is limited in its effect. So in order for this right to be infringed, somebody has to copy what you've actually done. They have to access it and reproduce it. It doesn't protect the underlying idea. So this can leave in particular small companies very exposed if they depend on this. A competitor can take the basic idea and just recode it. And to my mind, there's nothing ethical in that. We need a system that's stronger than that 
to protect what people have come up with. Next slide, please. So confidential information is another one which I mentioned. And this is one which is very heavily depended upon generally by small companies. Large companies tend to know the limits of this. Small companies somehow assume that their technology is protected because it's all locked down. Nobody can see it, nobody can access it, and therefore they have this thing called confidential information or trade secret. And in a few moments, Tom is gonna to go through a um, case study which drills down into some of the risks of confidential information. But broadly speaking, it requires a duty of confidence. Therefore, as soon as the confidential information gets into the public domain, that right is lost, even if it was yours in the first place. It doesn't protect you against independent derivation. So somebody else could independently come up with your same concept or idea that you're very carefully keeping secret um, and use it, even if you got there first. Even better than that, somebody could actually protect it with a patent, even if you got there first. And this is why it's so important to understand the rules around the patent system, the rules around these rights, to make sure that they are leveraged ethically and properly on both sides by people who are getting the rights and people who may want to use other people's rights, but in a respectful way. They want to understand them and ask for the right licenses. So let's talk about patents for a bit, which according to the software debate that raged, and is still to some extent, you know, in discussion today, that patents are inherently unethical, they're inherently bad, they're a monopoly right. So we don't want them to stop people using software, right? That's the idea. Now they are a monopoly right, and that's great in one respect, because it means that you don't require copying to infringe them. Now they're a monopoly right, so that's really bad, right? Because it stops everybody. But no, if you've got a patent, you don't have to use it to stop people. You can use it to enable people. You can use it to enable the right people to use what you've done. All it does is grant to you the monopoly to control your idea. They can protect broad concepts. They're not restricted to particular lines of code or particular bits of maths. They can protect broad concepts. And they can last for up to 20 years, but they don't have to. You can decide how long it lasts. If after a few years, you decide you don't want your patent to be in the way or even on the register out there, you don't have to renew it, it's up to you. So all patents do is give the patent owner the right to control what they want to have happen with their innovation. And I would say that's, that's a very ethical approach and that the patents form part of the ethical intellectual property framework that exists in nearly all countries throughout the world. So next slide, please. So I got to the end of a similar discussion a couple of weeks ago, actually, about software and patents. And at the end, one of the questions was, well, can you patent software? So I thought I must have failed on something in my delivery, but I do want to explain, and this is the slide that explains it. Can you patent software? and indeed AI, and indeed AI mathematical models? And the answer is a categoric yes. Yes, you can. And I think I've pointed out just earlier why you might want to, um, but Tom's also gonna discuss that in a bit more depth. But you can, the law permits it. The law allows you to obtain patents for any solution to a technical problem that's new and non-obvious. Now, there are lots of technical problems in the field of AI, and indeed both Ilias and Sophia, who we just heard, have spoken about some of those to do with bias, to do with training data, to do with accuracy. We want these problems to be solved. We want companies to be encouraged to solve these problems. And these problems could be solved in software. They are, they are solved in software, let's be honest. AI is all about computing and maths and software, right? So the patent system says, if you're solving these problems, you can be granted a patent provided it's new and not obvious. The patent system also allows you to grant technical patents for technical applications, machine learning models, 
training methods, data collection. So all number of AI innovation, all things of AI innovation can potentially be the subject of a patent, which can be really useful in the hands of the right people. So what does new mean? Just a little bit on the subject of new, because it's one of the legal requirements. That means it hasn't entered the public domain. And this is really an important sort of little tip, if you like. Even if it's your own idea and your own software and your own models, if you put them in the public domain and then you want to get a patent, you can't because you've destroyed the novelty of your own invention. So there's an important timeline here to be respected when you want to make use of the patent system. So I think at this point is where I hand over to Tom and he is going to discuss a particular case study which brings a lot of these sort of generic issues much more down to earth. Over to you, Tom. Thanks, Virginia. So this case study is about a hypothetical company, but, but pretty much everything I'm going to say in this is, is real in the sense that it has happened to at least one of the companies that we've, we've worked with over the years. So Virginia and I come from a, a private practice background, and in a sense, our, our approach to kind of ethical questions is always going to be quite practically minded. So the, the sort of idea here is companies at the moment, like it or not, and Virginia's talked about the kind of debates that have happened in around software patents in particular, the world is the way it is. And actually, a lot of these kind of debates have already happened at the level of policymakers. And, and like it or not, they have come to conclusions on this. And these are kind of baked, in, uh, baked into uh, what can sometimes seem like fairly kind of dry procedural requirements, the patent system, but are actually trying to balance fairly fundamental questions of the right of innovators to protect their ideas versus the rights of third parties to not be unduly limited in, in their own enterprises. Uh, and whichever side you come down on, on that debate, the one certainty in all this is that if you are a company starting out in this space, lack of awareness around IP is not going to serve you well and is going to harm your interests. Uh, a good thing about awareness, it's, it's cheap knowledge becoming aware of some of these core requirements around ip and how you can be damaged if you don't take proper steps all that requires is building up knowledge within the company and training uh, and we're going to see now how that might actually work in practice so if we look at this this example we've got a data science ai company as is quite common in in this kind of space their their model is that they've focused a lot of time and energy on a specific but, but very useful problem in, in data science. Actually, this, this is a problem that a lot of companies encounter and, and the business model of this startup is to actually provide their software and services to larger companies, essentially to allow larger companies to sort of outsource some of the problems around understanding the insights in their data. So you have a situation here, very common, where you have big companies owning vast quantities of data they're trying to unlock the insights in all that, and the startup has really cracked a way to actually do it in a, in a particular context. And the startup company takes the view that, that we're an innovative company. We, we're not really into patents. That's, that's not for us. We come from a more open source mindset. Uh, but they still have some notion that what they're doing is proprietary perhaps some sort of ethically driven notion that because of all the time, energy, investment, resources they've put into this, that, that surely that has to be enough. That has to be giving us some kind of protection that, that our innovation is, is ours. And in the first couple of years, this, this is all fine because really what's driving that company forward is, is, their, is their leading edge and the fact that they really do have a technical edge in the innovation in this particular space over third parties and, and over their customers. And you sort of see this in their pipeline, which, which will have a lot of old components in there, open source models, for instance. But a couple of really core cool pieces around this that, that really drive that solution that, that the company's found. Uh, and that could be something perhaps around the user interface, because that's actually the mechanism that allows people to interact with their output in an intuitive way and actually really use their analytics to, to their full benefit. 
uh, and perhaps something going on in the back end. Maybe it's around training or the particular model selection or the way they're preparing their data. But actually, you know, when you look at it, you might think, well, why didn't why didn't we think of that? But but they didn't. They got there first, and and that's really cracked this this problem. Now, what happens is that after a couple of years, they've been in back and forth conversations with their customers, these large companies. These large companies have their own tech teams in-house. Uh, and at some point, one of their big customers, the CTO in that company, takes a look at this and thinks, well, we're spending quite a lot of money on, on, external, on external contractors, on external services, and, and we've got our own you know, crack in-house team here. I think we can I think we can ditch these guys. I think we can take this in house. Now if we look at at the situation there, the the startup's initial response is as we said, well well surely they, they can't do that. We we've put all this time, energy investment in this and our our tech is proprietary. It must be proprietary. It can't not be. But if we actually take a look back to that earlier slide and those categories of intellectual property rights that Virginia outlined, that's basically it. There aren't some sort of additional overarching rights that, that somehow mean that you, know, you don't have those, but you've still somehow got control. Those are the rights that you have or don't have. And if we look at the timeline of this company, of the startup, in the early days, you've, you've got a lot of uh, kind of early stage ideas that, that ultimately become the, the end product. And yes, they are proprietary in the sense that there's only a couple of people around the, in that company. Uh, no one else is really looking at this problem, or at least they're not looking at it in this way. Those early ideas are genuinely confidential and they are protected by the legal provisions of confidential information. It's more of a practical point, but because the company is at such an early stage, there haven't really been those opportunities for those, those ideas to leak, leak out. But that doesn't last for very long at all. So as soon as that company starts having early discussions with potential investors, informal chats, pitching, as Virginia talks about novelty, the requirement of novelty is that it hasn't entered the public domain. And you can put your own ideas into the public domain by any any means at all, any channel, it doesn't have to be in other it doesn't have to be in published patents, it doesn't have to be in papers. Uh, informal, verbal, oral chats, tweets, social media, any of this can be the thing that is leaking that information out of your company. And once it's out there and in the public domain, those legal safeguards around confidential information are gone for good because that information no longer satisfies the fundamental requirement that it is actually confidential. And this only gets worse over time. So as you start to exhibit at tech events, serious pitching to investors, you, you can't be an AI company these days and just claim to have a magic black box. No one believes in the power of, of magic black boxes anymore. You need to sell your tech, and in order to sell your tech, you need to tell people about your tech and what makes it special. And every time you do that, these necessary things to drive a business forward and, and allow you to compete, you are giving away your confidential information. And if you're not doing other things to, to secure it, for instance, really through patent protection, then, then you're, you're giving away that protection over time. And it's, it's free there for other people to then pick up and run with provided they're not copying your code. Now, and what you really see is that actually, even if this company does have some notion of its core IP at the center of all this, even though it's, it's taken this attitude, we're not gonna patent it, we know this stuff's going out there, but we've locked down our core IP. That's probably not the case in practice, certainly over a company operating for a couple of years. And one of the big channels where this can leak out is that actually in serving their bigger customers, that startup is inevitably having to uh, educate them on how their tech works. And in order to do that, and, and as part of doing that, this is now feeding out into the public domain. Now, I know we're running a little short on time, so I'm just going to skip over a couple of bits. But the other point to make it is that within these companies, actually, there's a lot more probably <laughs> potentially going on than you think that's, that's meaning this confidential information is not being kept confidential whether that's a PhD student who interns in the company, and then it turns out includes key details of, of this core IP in their PhD thesis. That's not a hypothetical scenario that has actually happened to at least one company 
startup scale up that we've worked with. And what you see in this situation is, is that the much more IP savvy bigger company is realizes that they're free to go their own way. They might not be able to build such a good uh, solution as the, the startup, but it's good enough. And it's certainly good enough to satisfy their CTO that this is a good, a good decision on a kind of cost benefit analysis. Uh, and essentially, that, that's it. I mean, you see there a startup company who has been completely scuppered by a lack of awareness around intellectual property and an over-reliance on some notion of trade secrets and fairness. Surely this can't be the way it is because it's unfair. But the truth of it is, is that there is, because the, the, in, in all of the stuff that Virginia was talking about earlier, these decisions about balancing the right of innovators versus the right of third parties, they're baked into the mechanics of the patent system. They're baked into the mechanics of things like novelty and the fact that you can't file a patent once you put your own idea in the public domain. There are slightly different nuances on this in different countries, but the general idea there is that you shouldn't be able to go back in time and nab things back in time that, that you put into the public domain some time ago. So if you're not aware of these issues and you're not aware that actually these, these ethical questions have already been decided on by policymakers, you're not going to do yourself a service and you're certainly not going to be on a level playing field with the, the bigger companies in this space who are much more IP aware. I think that first bullet point is where I'm going to end it on because that's, that's really the crux of it. Patents and IP and IP awareness and proper IP strategy can really help to level the playing field between big and small companies. And that's the reality of the world that we currently live in.